you know, I should probably go through and mark the midterms. It's just, that's the way it should be done. Come on, it's five students. I can do this. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know how to distract you from that. I, I'm going to have to make some evil plan. I don't know. Well, the grade is the grade, Samra. <laughs> it get, it's get, I have it sitting in my inbox. Um, I appreciate it. I was actually hoping that you would just announce the grade in the last two online classes. I was just hoping not to face. I, I am, I'm the oldest student in the class, and we have such so a shame if I get grades, you know, less than the undergrad. I, I, I bet I would like to be an, become an ostrich, you know, duck my face right into the dirt. I don't know. Okay, well, that is always an option. Um, <laughs> All right. So I'm going to move on with our course material. <laughs> so to, um, okay. today I want to really cover, we'll see how far I get. Um, but what I want to start with is um, rasmization protecting groups in, in chemistry. So if we get through this in a good, in peptide chemistry, if we get through this in a good place, then I think we might convert to start talking a little bit about uh, solid phase peptide synthesis. So last class, um, those of you who are there and those of you who might have caught up with the video, uh, it was introduction to peptides and proteins. We covered uh, two of the more common, and for the purpose of this course, the only ones we really need to worry about, uh, coupling agents, which are the uh, carbodiimides and the benzotriazoles. I turn my video on because I'm waving around with my hands. And so, there we go, hands. And so what I want to talk about now is the, the advantages and disadvantages of those things and the issues that we have and this racemization thing and then how we get around that and how we use protecting groups because we use kind of fungible fake protecting groups last class. So this, the racemization issue comes about because, well, you're all smart people. So if I have a chiral center adjacent to a carbonyl, and let's say it is an ester, and I treat that with a base, let's say, I don't know, I'm not feeling very smart right now. Um, Triethylamine with heat. Let's do that. It'll do it. What happens if I let this go long enough? Would the um, amide or the, the nitrogen attack the carbonyl carbon or? It could. Um, that's probably not what's going to happen though. Um, I suppose the alpha proton will be taken up by the base. Perfect. So you'll generate an enolate. So I've drawn it with the stereochemistry, but of course that's incorrect because what happens is you've got really good resonance. Love resonance. And this center has just gone flat. Now, what's gonna happen is of course, this is a much, much stronger base than this guy. So as soon as that happens, you're going to scoop this proton right back up. But you got a 50% chance of making that.
or that. So base epimerizes. Chiral centers, stereo centers, let's be, let's be right. They're not chiral centers. That is an incorrect term. It doesn't exist or mean anything. Um, we're going to go all oh, pack on this next to carbonyls. You know, depending on the strength of the base, depending on the details of the carbonyl, it's faster, it's slower, whatever. But it happens. Now, we've got a problem here because, so in a normal acid, like carboxylic acid, not an issue because normally a carboxylic acid spends a lot of its time existing as a carboxylate, like O minus, and you're not going to generate a C minus next to an O minus. That's stupid. It's not going to happen. And your average ester is also fine because esters normally donate in through the oxygen. So they actually stabilize that carb that positive charge to make it less positive. So they make it harder to deprotonate that alpha proton. So esters really aren't all that acidic. This is a problem with ketones and aldehydes, but we don't need to worry about that because we don't have ketones and aldehydes and amino acids. So what are we losing our shit over? Well, we're losing our shit over it because when you're making our molecules, and we talked about this last class, um, hey. We had Kirsten's tryptophans. So let's say we got tryptophan. Here we go. And we activated this. So we used either HCTU, we used DCC, we used something. Well, let's say we do that. And X by definition is going to be some sort of electron withdrawing group. Like these DCC, like this urea thing, or this, uh, these benzotriazoles, or even an acid chloride, just sticking a chlorine on there. The other ones are just fancy acid chlorides. Like they're they're more stable, they're a little happier, but they really are all the and they're easier to make, but they really are just fancy acid chlorides. What you're doing now, of course, is this is pulling electron density out. It's no longer donating electron density in. It's electron withdrawing. It, it by definition, you want to make it negatively charged. It wants to be a good leaving group. We want it to be a good leaving group. Oh shit, we're just making this guy pretty positive. So now suddenly we have an activated ester. So we have a problem. Now, we're lucky that basic physics is in our favor. So for most of the ones we were doing, you know, you throw in a little bit of triethylamine, diastroboethylamine, you keep them around for a few hours or a day, normally okay. You're not gonna get very much epimerization, well under 1%. It's a slow process in those kinds of systems. You use a stronger base, and you're in trouble. But that's why what we're gonna find out is we never use a stronger base in peptide chemistry than diastroboethylamine or, tri or triethylamine really. And the reason is this, we wanna avoid this problem. Once you make it into an amide, they're rocks, don't epimerize. So you're safe if you can get to the amide. Okay, this is easy to avoid. Just don't use any strong base. Don't be a moron. And so you happily go about not making any strong base. Okay, this is not our major problem now in epimerization. Our major problem in epimerization, well, it, it is if the one the one caveat I'm gonna do is 
is you can get screwed if you have a weird amino acid. So the natural ones are all fine. They behave themselves just fine. But, you know, let's say you're playing around. You're like, I'm going to be really clever. I'm going to do also some really fancy ass med chem. And I'm going to fluorinate something. So I have a project with a company I want to do. And we want to play around with some psychedelics because they like psychedelics. And I'm curious about psychedelics. So I want to do stuff with mescaline. And I say, you know what we're going to do is we're going to take mescaline and we're going to fluorinate it. And that's going to improve how it binds to the receptor. And that's probably a true statement. And then I looked it up and somebody did it last year. And I'm like, fuck. I guess I'll have to have a new idea. Well, that's okay. I will come up with a new idea, which isn't fluorinating mescaline. Maybe we'll fluorinate mescaline at a different site. <laughs> Anyways, so let's say you, uh, you're you getting fancy. You take alanine. You fluorinate alanine because you're like, okay, I'm going to improve the binding here. Um, and the reason we like doing this is... That's cool, Paul. The reason we like doing this is because water can inc incorporate a CH3 group a lot better than a CF3 group. So the CF3 group kind of gets shoved away from the water, which means it's going to dive into a enzyme binding pocket. And unlike hydrogen, fluorine is electron drawing, so you have this nice negative surface around there. Maybe there's some positive things it can interact with. And that is about the level of... Um, of understanding how have why fluorinating things is good for binding. It really, where it really comes into its own is it slows down metabolism. Um, your cytochrome P450, your oxidation enzymes, don't know what to do with fluorinated molecules because nothing is fluorinated in our body. Like, it's just not a thing that our body does is use fluorine as an element. So it slows down metabolism a lot. So your drug lasts longer, so it has a stronger effect. Anyways, so you fluorinate this thing. Now you're in trouble, though, with triethylamine. This is why you can't buy this uh, amino acid and it's numerically pure. Because super acidic. It memorizes. There's really nothing you can do about it. You're screwed. So there are some amino acids that if you're designing amino acids, you want to avoid strong electron drawing groups right next to that NMR center. Anyway, so that's the caveat. That's the one place it screws up. But if you look in nature, um, you know, we've got bases in nature, so it's had to take this into account. And that's why there's no amino acids with strong electron drawing groups right next to the NMR position. They're always a little bit further off. Um, like if phenylalanine was right, like if you had glycine alanine, with the phenyl ring right on it pimerizes easily. Again, resonance. And that's why, of course, we have phenylalanine and not glycine alanine as one of the 20 canonical amino acids. There are some bacteria that use glycine alanine like this, or phenylglycine. Phenylglycine, that's the word I'm looking for. Glycine alanine is, of course, a glycine attached to an alanine. Phenylglycine. And uh, they actually have it as a racemic mixture in their proteins which is kind of neat because you normally think about nature being chiral all the time. And then they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's just, uh, we have this thing, either R or S, it doesn't really seem to matter. Makes you wonder why they bother. But these are kind of weird specialty side cases. I just want to talk about the problem with the epimerization. Where we really get problems with this is let's think about what I actually drew there. So I drew an acetate alanine. Now there's a there's a couple of reasons we don't use acetate as a protecting group on nitrogen in peptide synthesis. One is uh, there's no easy way to take it off, so it's not a very good protecting group. You need to put it on, you need to be able to take it off, and 
uh, states count pain the ass to remove. Um, the second is what I'm about to show you. So you take this molecule and you're, you know, you're happily doing it. You activate it. Unfortunately, what can happen is this, you know, you count your atoms, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Five membered ring. Very possible. You just put a really good leaving group on there. That was the whole point of X is that it's a really good leaving group. Cause if it's not a really good leaving group, why'd you put it on there? Um, okay. So question for the crowd. What's the hybridization state of this oxygen? Here, this guy. SP three. Nope. Can I draw SP2? a resonance structure with it? Yeah. Because oh, look at this, right? I can draw a resonance structure. You know what? I'm actually going to draw the other one because I think it's the one I want to focus on. Resonance arrows. And I'm not just doing this because I love resonance, though I am partially doing this because I love resonance. I just love that, you know, fundamental organic chemistry explains everything. Okay, so we have this. Okay, so I want to compare it to another molecule. This is furan. Now, is furan aromatic? We know benzene's aromatic. It's furan aromatic. What's the definition of aromaticity? Is it two n plus four or something like that? Pi electrons? Or... I forget. Two n plus two pi electrons. Okay. Yeah. So, so then, yes. How many pi... So yes, yeah, so there's six because this is sp two. So two, four, six, six pi electrons. Here we have six pi electrons too, right? So you can have these aromatic systems with five atoms in them, six atoms in them. That's fine. Now. Molecules like being aromatic, right? You get like aromaticity has joy unto itself. Like you, you, your benzene is more stable than some sort of imaginary cyclohexatriene where the double bonds are isolated and can't do aromatic, aromatic things. Like benzene is very, very stable because it is aromatic because the electrons can flow this way or they can flow that way and everything is connected with each other and everything's making bonds and everything's happy. Okay, so structure I've drawn on the left here, on the right, sorry. Is that aromatic? No. No, because it doesn't, it's cyclic, which is good, uh, but it only has four pi electrons and not every atom in that cycle is sp2 hybridized right like we have an sp3 carbon over here but you're doing peptide coupling so what do you have in there well you got some triethylamine suddenly so you have a base so now let's think about this proton here how acidic do you think that guy is on a compared to like this guy. It's the same proton, different structure. More 
acidic and cyclic structure? Yeah, way more acidic. Do you know why? Um, the charge this uh, this location maybe it's causing. Mm. Uh, you, you okay? Yeah, you got you got some. You're right. I'm gonna actually say the reason is because you're gonna make an aromatic molecule. If you deprotonate that, because if I remove that, if I use a base, Keep an eye on the furan over there on the left-hand side. And that's essentially what we've made is furan. We've replaced one of the our carbons with a nitrogen, big whoop. But the the rest of this thing is, no, no, go away. I don't want notifications. It looks like there's five dots there, which is one dot too many. And a lone power on this nitrogen. So, and I guess three lone pairs of this oxygen for keeping track. So at this point, we've made this. This guy's aromatic. It's called oxazolone. 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 That's the pronunciation. Don't care. The issue is, is that what we've done is because we've activated that ester and because we have a nucleophilic amide over on that other side, the damn thing can ring close. It's all in equilibrium. We got a resonance structure. And then that resonance structure, we easily see that we can deprotonate that proton. And then we just made this atom flat. So we can go all the way back, but now we have epimerized. Because half the time that is going to protonate from the top face, half the time that is going to protonate from the bottom face, and suddenly all the stereochemical information that was in your basic alanine there at the beginning is gone. So that was with an amide bond. So this happens anytime you're making a peptide. So let's say we had alanine, alanine, and we wanted to make alanine, al at a glycine, and we want to make alanine, alanine, glycine. Let me think about this because I don't like my logic. Uh, well, I don't, I, I actually think I'm, I'm trying to be clever here and I think I'm getting myself into trouble. So we always read these N to C. So alanine, alanine means And if we want to add a glycine, so we want a couple of these two together. So we've got, again, we have a couple problems here. We need to protect, and we're going to come back to this, we're going to need to protect these two so we don't have these two react. Easy enough. Let's just magically, through the magic of pens, stick a methyl group on there. And I don't know. I'm going to come back to what this is, but let's put a Bach group over there. Great. Now they're protected. We're going to, like later this lecture, we're going to talk about what Bach is. Now it's easy. Now we just need to couple. 
the problem, so let's say we do this using, I don't know, DIC, triethyl mean. And if you follow through the mechanism as we talked about last class, you'll get to a point where You have that. This one, these, these aren't attached. That's just a down wedge. And it's there's a block, there's a nice focal group nearby. So what we just discussed is that awesome leaving group. So we have an awesome leaving group. And now we have the same problem we just talked. I don't know how I just raised that. Same problem we just talked about because we have an amide bond here. Now it's part of another amino acid, but it's exactly the same thing as the acetate. That like, like you know, there's other shit attached on this methyl group, but really it's just, it's the same thing. So we get oxazolinone formation. Oxazolone formation. I really don't want to say it properly. Now I'm going to draw the oxazolone. And this is actually, you know what, if the oxazolone was dead, I don't think we'd have as much trouble with it. We probably wouldn't be, I probably wouldn't be talking as much about this and just saying like, be careful, it's a side reaction. You don't want it to happen, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you make the oxazolone. This can then protonate either from the top or the bottom. So I'm going to draw as a wiggly line. And so you get this. Now the issue is you have your glycine here. Do, 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 floating around, happy as a pig. And it's looking at this and going, I'm cool with this. I'm just going to attack. I'm going to change my pen color. Not sure it helps, but. And now we're in trouble. You follow that all through. Yay, we remade the amino acid. This weird, scary thing has gone away. Problem is now we've epimerized that center. And oh, look, we've attached the next glycine. So the oxazolone is still reactive. Has a shea squiggly line. So that's still a shea squiggly line. Anyways, I give up. Um, but what we can do is we can still do chain extension. Like this is, it's maybe it's not as good a leading group as the urea, because if it was, then it wouldn't do the chemistry, right? The urea is a really good leading group. That's great. But we still have something that can react and we can do a chain extension 
but now we're going to have a mix of this epimerized stuff where we have the wrong stereo center. And if you have the wrong stereo center and a peptide, you can lose all activity because now it's not the same peptide, right? Like things are bent in different ways. It's not the same thing. Um, actually, no, that's all I have to say is you have the wrong stereo center. And note that this isn't a feature of what type of activating group we're using or, you know, how careful you are. It's an inbuilt issue with peptides. So every, what's really funny is I, I, I saw a, um, a review of an article and I, I was reviewing an article and they had this new way to make peptides going the wrong way, going from um, N to C. And I'm going to, so we always make them C to N. They're going to go from N to C and said, hey, this could be useful and all that. And the other reviewer point out, it's like, it doesn't matter. You're going to have this epimerization problem. There's no way around it. There's a reason we don't do that. There's a reason nature doesn't do that. Nature always goes C to N as well. Same thing because nature still has epimerizable proton problems. It doesn't magically not have that problem. So you can't go the wrong way on this. You have to basically build these, this direction. The only way you can go the wrong way on them is if you use something with no base present whatsoever. So you can never deprotonate to make the oxazolone. oxazolone. Uh, so if you do acidic conditions. Uh, and um, there are a couple people who've done that. It's really stupid. So take home message from all this is oxazolone problems prevent C to N synthesis. N to C synthesis. So, just kind of like, it's like the speed of light. There's just a barrier that prevents us from doing it that way. And as much as you want to do it that way, and as much as you think you found a clever way to do it that way, um, it's not. Like it, you, you, I think at this point, um, base catalyzed synthesis of amino acids is far more effective, efficient and effective and safer than acid catalyzed syntheses. So I think that there's no way around that. So must avoid. Amides. amino acids. Because if you have an amide on your amino acid, this is going to be a problem. Uh, like if you're trying to use an amino acid for biology, if you don't care if it has biological activity, like some of the stuff that we're working on, um, then it doesn't matter. But if you're trying to use it for biology, you can't have an amide because you are going to run into that issue. So what do you use then instead? So this takes moves us now into protecting groups. For the amine. So there are three main protecting groups for amines in like the alpha amino group in peptide synthesis. I'd say this covers, again, I throw around big numbers, but I think we're probably at the point of 99.9% .9 of all amino acids made with protecting groups on amine fall into one of, or use one of these three amino uh, protecting groups. I'm sure there's some obscure group in the Czech Republic that's doing something different because the Czechs are a little weird. So the big one, big three are Bach, CBZ, 
an F mock. Take these in turn. So Bach is that. So I'm going to refer to this as, I would refer to this molecule as Bach Ala OH. So Bach on the amine, alanine, carboxylic acid, or free OH on the other side. So I could, I could draw it out or I could call it Bach Ala OH. I'll use the three letter abbreviations. Um, to indicate the amino acid in a lot of cases. If you need to pull up a table of those three letter abbreviations, go ahead and do it. Uh, I'm prob for the course stuff here, I'm probably gonna stick mostly to just a handful of amino acids. All this is applicable to all the amino acids. You do not need to memorize those tables. That is a stupid thing to have to memorize. So this is an acid sensitive protecting group. I don't think that should surprise people. Hopefully that's acid sensitive. So the way we put it on is we take Bach and hydride. It's a very satisfying molecule to draw, I find. So we have some amine, and then we normally have a weak base. The base of choice is often imidazole. We attack the carbonyl. Electrons go up, electrons come down, and we break off the better leaving group. We don't break off the at the um, the alkoxide on the other side because that's a fat leaving group. We break off the guy on the left there, the carbonate, and that's because it's a really good leaving group and it's a really good leaving group. Because what happens next? And this is important because it's what happens with Bach as well. So, boom, all good. We've got the Bach on the nitrogen, but this, of course, decarboxylates. Reactions that make gas are great reactions, and they work really, really well. This reaction makes gas. It's a great reaction. It works really, really, really well. So we can put Bach on. How do we take Bach off? Acid. So the standard acid to do this is 50% TFA in dichloromethane. So if I take, I just stuck the Bach on. Now I'm gonna take it off. This all seems like a real waste of time. I've got a computer here so I can look up what the pK of acetic acid is, or TFA. Acetic acid will not take it off. Um, our pK is about 0 0.5. So pretty freaking acidic. Uh, you can also use things like HCl. That'll do it just fine. But there's no reason to do that. You can. It's fine. Depends on the conditions. 
but TFA is the most normal one. So how is it doing this? Well, the whole point of this carbonate is it's actually really stable. It's not nucleophilic. It's not very basic. Carbonates are very stable. This is a carbonate, by the way. Carbamate, sorry. It's like a carbonate, but it's got azide in it. So we're going to randomly throw some E's in there and make it sound fancy. So carbamate. Just spat on my reaction. And so that that is not all that basic, because if it was basic, we would have this oxazolone problem. And it's not very nucleophilic, because if it was nucleophilic, we would have this oxazolone problem. So the whole choice is choose a very relatively inert kind of thing. So you need a strong acid to protonate it. TFA is a strong acid. So let's protonate. Now, I'm going to just protonate by convenience. On to the nitrogen. But no, you know what? We'll do this right. To get that. Then what happens? Is oh shit, that's weird. You get that. Tertiary carbocation, very, very stable, but it's not going to last very long. Lose a proton, becomes isoprene. Oh, look, that's a gas. And it escapes. So your Bach D protections are always going to bubble on you because it's isoprene escaping. And you just regenerated the H plus that you lost. But of course, this is a very unstable molecule. So, you know, you just got that H plus. Let's protonate the amine. Because why not? And Oh, look, another molecule of gas. So, Bach D protection involves two molecules of gas catalyzed by acid. And that's really, like, ridiculously entropically favorable because you lose the isoprene and you lose the carbon dioxide. So Bach goes on with weak base, minazole, catalyst, base, thingy. Um, I didn't draw its role in here, but its role in here is to sponge up. Sponges up H+. Plus. Because notice that there's only one H here. So this guy just helps um, spook that up. The extra H that was on here should end up on this terputoxide. Uh, the imidazole just kind of assists in all that process. So, Bach. Uh, you know what? I'm going to summarize at the end. Do CBZ next. I don't understand why this is called CBZ. Uh, Carbonyl benzoyl is where it comes from. Unsurprisingly, it's another carbonate, carbamate. So 
So same kind of idea. And if you remember back to talk about the sugar stuff, we we're saying that likes hydrogen. So unsurprisingly, and what we're doing here is the same thing we do. We reduce this carbon oxygen bond. The reason we do that is because it's an activated bond because it's benzylic. So I'm just going to And now we're in the exact same situation we just faced with the Bach, which is we have this carboxylic acid thingy attached to the nitrogen. It's kind of like the carbamate, but we're missing the R group. And so we cleave it off very easily. How do we put it on? Well, this one, there's two options. You can get CBZ chloride. Or you can get the anhydride. Same kind of chemistry, you got a free amine, you got this thing, you mix it together, you're done. So, not a lot new under the sun, basically. This just always makes me really nervous because there's just way too many oxygens in a row on all these, um, these kind of anhydrides of carbonates. I, I really don't like them very much. They are explosive. Whenever you have that many heteroatoms in close proximity, things kind of want to become gases, and that's what an explosion basically is. And so you do need to be careful with all of these anhydrides. So with this one in particular, the chloride is much more generally available. The Bach is has got those big terpetal groups. It kind of slows down the whole decomposition thing. I don't really understand why. Because it's not like you need other molecules being involved to blow up. Um, yeah, just stuff. Um, but this, uh, the CBZ anhydride is actually quite explosive. Uh, works really, really well, but gets shipped in an explosion proof box. Then the last one, and this is, I think, by far the most important, is FMOC. Um, it's the youngest, I think, FMOC state back to the 1970s, which isn't that long ago. And FBOC fluorenyl is what that stands for. I don't know what the M stands for. Methyl, I think. Fluorenyl methyl. So I always find he's funny. This. You know, there's a real push these days towards green chemistry. And we're going to actually talk about click chemistry a little bit later in the course because I think it's a really important part of the curriculum. We don't cover it and it kind of fits in well with where I want to go with the materials side of this course. And one of the big principles of green chemistry is atom efficiency. Don't have extra atoms in there that you don't need. So this is FMOC alanine. And like 80% of the molecule is a protecting group. Like the alanine is just this tiny little thing up there on the side. Like most of this molecule is this protecting group. It's really atom inefficient uh, and really, really bad for the environment. Like it's just, this is just bad. And I have, um, I have no idea how we're going to replace this. It, it will be replaced someday. Someday somebody will find 
a better alternative to using fmoc for this stuff. But that day hasn't happened yet. So, again, that's the fmoc. It was an awful lot of money in finding a better replacement for FMOC. So the way, um, but it's going to be hard because it's so freaking useful. So one thing is it's fluorescent. This is great because it's really easy to find. Everyone loves fluorescence. Um, and except for Kirsten's tryptophan, all the other amino acids really aren't very fluorescent, and so they're hard to find. So the wonderful thing about FMOC is you can easily track things through it. And we'll see how you can actually program robots to do a lot of stuff for you because of the fluorescence of FMOC. The other thing that's really special about it is it's really insensitive to most everything. Like it is actually stable to a lot. It looks like it should be unstable to hydrogen gas, and it isn't particularly. Uh, you can take off CBZ groups with it on. You can take off benzyl groups with it on. You actually have to really crank to get the FMOC to come off using hydrogen gas. It's got something to do with the increases in aromatic energy isn't really very big. I don't fully understand that. The other thing is it's really, really acid stable. You can crank on this stuff with like concentrated HCl with heat and it does nothing. So the only thing, and a lot of bases, it's completely inert to. It just doesn't care about most bases. The only couple of bases that really cause trouble here are secondary amines. Which is good. So tertiary amines are fine. Triethylamine, diastroethylamine, they don't do anything to FMOC. Secondary amines, fuck it up. And so what happens is, so first of all, how do you put it on? Well, FMOC chloride, just like the benzoyl chloride that I showed you, or FMOC Uh, o suck. FMOC O6 cinamide. Write that a little bit underneath it. Um, there's a reason not to use this because FMOC chloride is kind of a nightmare. Again, I have no idea why. It's just I get like it, it's not very clean. You get kind of a mixture of stuff. And it's hard to purify. The FMOC O6 cinamide is a lot cleaner. I I have no insight into that. Um, the succinamide is a good leaving group. Maybe it's not quite as good a leaving group, so you suppress side reactions, but I, I've i never actually seen a really good description of why the O6 succinamide is a much better um, agent than FMOC chloride. You know, other people don't seem to have any trouble with FMOC chloride. It's just I do. It doesn't like me. So you take it off with piperidine. So let's say we have a FMOC group. I'm going to draw in that hydrogen because that's the hydrogen we care about. So papyridine is a secondary amine. It's like pyridine if pyridine went out and got itself some more hydrogens and so stopped being aromatic. And by pyridine, I do mean pyridine. I suddenly got confused and I thought I was thinking it was pyrrole, but no pyridine, six membered ring. So We're going to run over here. We're going to take away this proton. We're going to eliminate and make a new double bond. 
which is then going to kick out this oxygen. And then we're into the comfortable space that we have seen quite often of decarboxylation. So if anything, that just got even more fluorescent. It just had even more conjugation as if it needed it. And of course, I gen I've generated the amine as a negative charge, but you're going to have this protonated piperidine floating around, and of course, that's going to transfer over the proton. So, sorry, the problem is it's not pyridine, it does have a proton. It's not very clear. So, what we've done is we've generated this. This is brick dust. Um, it crashes out of everything. It's insoluble and everything. It's a pain in the ass. You can't get rid of it. It just, it's, it's, it's the worst thing ever. So this worst thing ever is what comes from this really useful, deep, uh, really useful protective group. So this is a problem. And that's why what you'll find is you won't find f -mock used a lot in solution phase chemistry because you make this and oh God, this is awful. Uh, but you'll find it used all the time in solid phase chemistry. So that's on the nitrogen. We can talk briefly about what goes on the carboxylic acid protecting. This we're going to find out is not so important. But let's discuss some options because I'm going to have some problems where you're going to need to think about this. I just want to make sure I've thought this through. So the main ones we see. Methyl ester. Uh, it shouldn't really surprise you that we want a base sensitive, an acid sensitive, and a hydrogen sensitive one because we have absolutely no creativity as chemists. Those are the big three. So, what time is it five o'clock on methyl ester? So, to make the methyl ester, you got some options. Depends on what your molecule is. If your molecule is really simple like this guy, you know, it's hard to argue Here's Fisher again. Shows up like a bad penny in his course. He's back with his esterification. So you heat the crap out of this thing with methanol, a little bit of acid catalyst. Under these conditions, of course, your proton is going to protonate your amine. That takes it out of action because now it's a protonated amine, so it's not nucleophilic. Your proton is going to protonate your carboxylic acid. 
which is just weird, but it can happen a little bit. And then you have a methanol that's going to come in and displace water. And of course, the driving force there is Le Chatelier's principle because you have a lot of methanol and you have very little water. So bye-bye water, hello methanol. You make the methyl ester. Now, the problem, of course, with this is you need to heat the crap out of this in acid. Uh, and depending on what else you have going on in your molecule, heating the crap out of stuff in acid is not always a very good idea. So this is my favorite example of why you use massively explosive materials. So this might be my favorite reagent of all time. Diazomethane. I'll make sure I draw this right. There we go. So that's diazomethane. It is Toxic, uh, fatal on contact, or by inhalation. Explosive on heating, or touching, or shaking. Um, it's basically death incarnate. It's also a massively useful reagent for doing chemistry. And it can be handled safely in solution, uh, which is how I always handle it and make it. But it's kind of one of these things where you respect what you're working with because it could end really, really badly. Um, but you can work with it very safely. And for this kind of thing, it's just brilliant because you can have a massively complex molecule. And if you have a carboxylic acid in it, and no matter what else is going on with the molecule, diazomethane at zero degrees Celsius or colder is just going to methylate the carboxylic acid. It's not going to do anything else, which is kind of amazing for something that explodes as soon as you look at it. You think it's going to be kind of reactive and just do weird shit, but it doesn't. So how does this work? Well, I've drawn a resonance structure of the diazomethane, but we can draw another one. You know what? No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish my thought. And then I'm going to draw it below. And that's what I'm going to do. It's also an incredibly clean reagent. It's kind of like the opposite of the FMOC thing we were just talking about, where there's all those effing atoms. Um, you add a methyl group and you generate nitrogen gas. Like it's, as far as green goes, it's very environmentally friendly. And it's cold, like you don't need to heat anything. Like it's, it's much, much more energy efficient than a lot of other things. Anyways, so we draw the, I'm gonna erase my resonance structures. We, if we draw the resonance structure of that, and this gives a clue onto both why it's reactive and why it's explosive. Again, things want to make gas and this molecule is so close to just making nitrogen gas at this point. Like all we need to do is break that carbon nitrogen bond and boom, we got nitrogen gas. Now it's not basic. It's a neutral molecule, but acids are really acidic. And so diazomethane can deprotonate the acid.
Yay, we've deprotonated the acid. We're neutral. Oh, no, we're not. We've got a positively charged nitrogen. There's probably no better leaving group in the universe than nitrogen gas. I'm probably wrong. But there isn't a better one on Earth at standard temperature and pressure. To say this is exothermic is to really underemphasize things. This reaction goes in about two or three seconds. Uh, it stays pretty cold. It's very, very specific. Very, very clean. Very good way to put a methyl group onto a carboxylic acid. Um, you can make diazomethane fresh. You actually make it from a chemical that we also use to induce tumors in rats. So you need to be very careful with that chemical. So the precursor is really, really toxic. Um, you can buy it. Don't recommend it. The guy I did my first postdoc with, his dad was the one who invented the way to distill it, which I really don't recommend um, because it explodes and lots and lots of people have died and there's no reason to ever distill it. You can just use it in solution. So you make it in solution yourself and you work with it. The one thing is you store it in the fridge when you're done. And what you want to make sure you do is that you don't forget it in the fridge because a few times a year I'll read in the chemical and engineering news that some fridge in some academic lab somewhere in the world blew up because somebody forgot to, that they had diazomethane in there and it detonated. So you need to destroy it when you're done with it, when you know you're done with it. Don't just leave it lying around. But it's a lot of fun to work with. Um, and I made like a few hundred grams of the precursor to make this a few years ago. It's one of the only reactions I've done since I've arrived at Windsor. But it felt really, really good to do something in the lab. So that's how you put methyl esters on. Uh, I got nothing so exciting for the benzyl esters or the box. Um, benzyl esters. really boring in respect pass some carbonate I, I i don't i just i can't get excited about this i don't know thf whatever benzyl bromide a little bit base acid stir that's a really really electrophilic site because it's adjacent to the phenyl group so a carboxylic acid is a good enough nucleophile when it's deprotonated to attack oh this is boring but benzyl, benzyl protecting groups are useful because they're easy to put on, they're safe to put on, they don't explode, uh, and they come off really nicely with uh, hydrogen gas. And normally that's orthogonal to whatever else you're using. Then the Bach protecting groups, that, that these can be kind of neat in how you can put them on. There's a bunch of ways to do it. Uh, one of my favorites is to bubble in isoprene into solvent. So it's kind of like the inverse of taking it off. Mild acid, because uh, you need a little bit of an acid catalyst to put it on. But, you know, you can basically generate the carbocation and the carbocation gets attacked by the acid. That's kind of cool. Or, you know, if you're more boring, Bach triflate or sorry, terp butyl triflate and heat. Ditto. So How to take these off, because I guess, you know, on, off, I guess we should talk about the off. Methyl esters are a lot less exciting to take off than they are to put on.
Normally what you actually want is a good nucleophile. So lithium chloride is actually the way that this is often done. And you're basically going to do a nucleophilic attack on a methyl group, kicking out a carboxylate leaving group. So it's not so much base sensitive as it is nucleophile sensitive. And the reason, like, Chlorine is not a great nucleophile, like iodine or bromine is a great greater nucleophile. The problem is if you use iodine or bromine, then you have a really good electrophile on the other side. And it's just going to go right back on. So that logic kind of falls apart. Whereas chlorine is a good enough nucleophile, but meth chloromethane isn't a great uh, electrophile. Plus it's a gas. And so it escapes. Iodomethane and bromomethane are not gases or liquids because iodine and bromine are a lot heavier than chlorine. So this is a good way to deprotect that. The other thing you can do is you can saponify, of course. The problem with saponify, like that's just sodium hydroxide and water and heat. The problem with this, of course, is that if you have anything else going on in your molecule, you can be in trouble because it's pretty strong conditions. takes you to the same place. As for the benzyl, hydrogen, palladium, done. Benzyl groups love coming off the hydrogen plate, and we saw it all the way through the carbohydrate chemistry. We're seeing it here again. We saw it just with the CVZ group. Notice that this, the uh, amine protecting the carboxylic acid protecting ones kind of parallel each other all the way down. And then we have the um, Bach. And of course, that is exactly what you expect. It's going to be acid, water. Bye bye. Sorry, not Bach, just terpeno ester or heat. So we can put these things on, we can take them off. Now, I think as an exercise, and I'm going to post these tomorrow morning and I'm going to make a note to myself to do that. I'm going to post assignments four and five, the last two assignments for the entire course. Um, and we have a lot of stuff in there about peptide synthesis and how to make, go about making a peptide. So I'm going to start talking about this next class. Where we run into trouble with a lot of these things is none of these reactions is particularly tricky. But if we think about however we want to do this, and we, we talked about this briefly last class, I need a protecting group on the nitrogen and a free OH. And if I attach that to a glycine, which has a free NH2 and a protecting group on the OH, then I can make So that's one step. Now I need to deprotect. So I need to remove one of those protecting groups. Then I need to couple it to the next amino acid. Then I need to deprotect. Then I need to couple this to the next amino acid. So every time I add an amino acid, I need to do two reactions. That means two isolations. That means two separations because no yield is 100%. We covered that a little bit last class with sort of a table of different, what the yields are as a function of the number of steps. Um, so your yields are dropping off really, really quickly. You're losing a lot of material. And that's just, that's like conversion. That's like making the right product, not only accounting for problems with separation, isolation, and all that stuff. So every time you need to separate this from a solving, you need to separate it from the other reagents, you need to purify it. it this is hard. So this was actually one of the, the first places where we had this thing called solid synthesis, solid phase synthesis. 
and the idea behind solid phase synthesis. Isolation is filtration. So what you do is you make a bead or a particle, something insoluble. It doesn't even need to be a really, and it, there's all sorts of different insoluble things, but I'm going to indicate that by a circle. They're not going to be this big. This is a huge circle. And on that bead, you know, I could pull up some pictures, but if you want, you can look up Wang resin. which I love because it tells you how recent this is, where almost nothing almost nothing in chemistry is not named after some dead German. And so the fact that this is named after a, I think it's still alive, um, Chinese-American scientist says that this is pretty recent and it's also an improvement on diversity in chemistry. But Wang resin is basically polystyrene, like, you know, polystyrene styrofoam, uh, cross-linked. So it is much denser and it's got a coat. So it doesn't dissolve in anything. And so it's this resin and you attach stuff to it. Like we're going to talk about Wang resin next class, but you basically can attach an amino acid. And as we were just talking about, we don't want to activate carbo carboxylic acids in the presence of an amide. And so we want to make sure that this is nitrogen side out because then anything we add has an activated carboxylate, but then we can protect it with a carbamate. So you can attach this and couple this with carbamate protected FMOC, for example, glycine. So this is not, when we activate this, we are not going to make oxazolones because that is not an amide, so it can't cyclize because it is a carbamate, so it's less likely to do that. So it's stable, so we're not going to epimerize. Uh, it's glycine, we weren't going to epimerize anyways, but you know, okay, let's, let's make, make it not glycine. It's getting really crazy, we'll turn to valine. I love the fact that valine has a V and it's called valine. It helps me. Anyway, so we avoid this whole problem of that. We mix those together with a coupling agent, HCTU, DIPA, stir them. And out of that, we get a V F block. And now I have this insoluble bead. And so to purify this reaction, I don't need to do a workup or anything. I just filter away everything because the HCTU is soluble in any excess HCTU is soluble in a solvent. Any excess of this is soluble in a solvent. The DIPA is soluble in a solvent. The solvent is soluble in a solvent. I just rinse away everything and I wash it a few times and all I have left is my bead with my thing attached. And now I'm ready for my next reaction. I don't need to go through and do an extraction and do an isolation or run a column. Um, no, the source of your HPLC woes is the shit that is on the Wang resin. We're going to talk about that next class. But you can really wash away all this garbage. Uh, from the reaction. And that mean, makes these reactions possible, basically, because it would be impossible to do this in solution phase with multiple isolations and separations. So this is where we're going to start next class. And we're going to compare solution phase and solid phase. We're going to talk about hybrid methods where you use both um, and why you want to use both. We're going to talk about some complications on this. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about some of the difficult couplings um and then what we can do with stuff on beads because now that we can do this kind of chemistry with washing away reagents 
suddenly it gets very tempting to do all sorts of chemistry on a bead because all you can do is just wash away everything else. You can't purify your product. If side reactions happen to your product, you're fucked because you can't separate that. You can't purify that. But as long as those are pretty minor, you can wash away all reagents. And so you need a clean reaction and a reaction you need to do a million times. And if you have those two parameters, solid phase synthesis is really, really helpful. So I'm going to leave it there because it's 522 and have a really good weekend.